like wait here if you want to. So today is going to be a more casual, contemporary praise type service. But we are Lutheran, so we still have some structure. We still have some liturgy. Just upping it a little bit. Um, can't think of really any announcements right now other than, of course, day after service. We are going to be having our congregational meeting. Um, if we have a bunch of people coming in late to where we have a crowd, then I'm going to ask you to get your food and bring it up and sit in here and eat because we have more room to spread out. But right now, this size group will be just fine downstairs, so we'll just kind of play it by ear so that we aren't packed together. We do have finger food for lunch, and we'll get our food, sit down, and get right to the meeting while we're eating. Then, of course, uh, a couple weeks from now, the quilt show. Be looking to see where you can help with that. Not necessarily that day. We need help the day before setting up, and we need help the end of that Saturday cleaning up and putting things away again. So lots of different ways that you can help to work around your schedule. And then in March, the Legacy Project concert. So have those on your calendar. Is there anything else? Very good. We have um, hopefully you picked up a song sheet. Along with your bulletin, you'll need that for the hymn after the sermon. Everything else is in your other song book, the red one laying on your pews. Let's stand and join together on our gathering song, number 249. <laughs> Sorry and humbly repent. In 
your compassion. Forgive us our sins. No one can unknow. Things that we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. We are so fortunate by being believers in Christ because we can come before him in our sinful state and confess our sins and he has promised that because he is just and merciful that he will forgive our sins. So know that because you have opened your hearts before the Lord that he's taking your sins from you, cleansed you from all unrighteousness, and restored you in a full relationship with him. Thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to turn to our opening hymn, number nine.
Support us in the word of the truth, that we may grow in faith in the midst of our trials. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Today's first reading is from the first chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the fourth verse. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet in the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a you. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a you. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, returns the Lord. Then the Lord put on his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. But you, rest yourself from work, arise, and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and brass walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Here is the first reading. We will read the Psalm number 71 responsibly. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my prey and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God. From the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always to you. I have become a burden to Mary. But you are my refuge and my strength. Let my mouth be full of your grace and your glory all the day long. Do not cast me off in my old age. Forsake me not when my strength fails. For my enemies are my enemies, and those who are not in wait for my life to be castled together. They say, God has forsaken him. Go after him to seize him. Because there is none who will say who will say. Today's second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. I will show you, you, a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels that have not loved, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prolific powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth, 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. For as prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Hear me, read. Okay. So every cookie I ever bake 
should be cut with this cookie cutter, otherwise it's not a cookie. No? I mean, we can have cookies that look different than a snowman? Okay, well, maybe that's why I've got other cookie cutters in my cupboard. Because maybe somebody wants an angel cookie, or a heart cookie, or a rabbit cookie. Why do we want a rabbit cookie? Easter. Right? Yeah, Easter time. I bet somebody would like to eat a rabbit cookie. So we have lots of different cookie cutters. What does this have to do with the Word of God? Well, today we have a story about the prophet that I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Jesus sent prophets to bring the word of God to other people or to groups of people. But he had different prophets. He didn't have the exact same one to bring every message to all the different people. Now, I wonder why that would be. I bet it's because we need some prophets who help a really big personality and a big voice and they can stand up in a stadium and preach with power to thousands of people all at one time. But would that be the right way to bring the message of God to somebody maybe laying in the bed in a hospital who's really sick? They don't want someone to come in and scream at them, right? They want someone to sit there quietly and maybe hold their hand and say, you know, God does love you. He's here with you to help you get through this, right? Well, just like that, there are some people that I can bring the word of God to, and they're going to hear it and be glad they heard it from me. But there's going to be other people, like maybe another kid, or even an uncle or a grandparent, that you can bring the word of God to, and they'll hear it from you, they won't want to hear it from me because you have a relationship with that person and they trust what you say to them. And that's why there's a scripture in the Bible that says all God's believers are prophets and we are all expected to go and tell the good news about Jesus each in our own way because there's somebody out there who can only hear and understand it from you. And there's somebody out there who can only hear and understand it from Miss Valerie, or from Mr. L, or from me. Now that's a big responsibility. So how can you have yourself ready to be able to tell people about Jesus? How could you get ready for a job like that? You can. How do you get prepared to do that trip or that job, that message? You probably need to know what you're talking about, right? Well, if we're going to talk about Jesus, how do we know about him? Perfect. You've got it all figured out. You learn about Jesus through the Bible, don't you? We also learn about Jesus from other people who already know him. Has your grandma ever talked to you about Jesus? I bet she has. Yes. Yeah. I think you can too, because you know quite a bit about him already. Let's pray about that. Oh, dear Father, you give us a really big job to go out and tell other people about your son. But we also know you've given us everything we need to do that job. So help us to be diligent to do the job that you have assigned to us and faithfully tell others about Jesus' love and salvation. Well, as noted in the bulletin, I am preaching on the Old Testament text from the Jeremiah lesson today. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, in order to understand the message found in our Jeremiah text, we need some background on the prophet Jeremiah. He's from the town of Ananoth, about three miles north of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is a member of the clan of Levi, meaning that he's from a priestly family. They can trace themselves back to Moses, and therefore he's a priest himself. His extended family had lost their standing years ago under the reign of King Solomon. He's no more than in his early 20s. Some think he's possibly still in his teens when God started him on his life as a prophet. Through the book of Jeremiah, we learn that God tells Jeremiah that he is not to marry and he is not to have children of his own. He will face imprisonment, persecution, false accusations of treason, a forced exile to Egypt, and an unfruitful search for just one righteous person. He will suffer to the point where he wished he had never been born. Jeremiah began preaching God's message in 627 BC and continued through the reign of five kings until 587 BC. That's 40 years of delivering God's message that people did not want to hear. Messages of destruction were spoken against Jerusalem and Judah, as well as Egypt, Gaza, Moab, Ammon, Syria, Edom, and Babylon, showing that God is a God over all nations, whether or not they acknowledge his authority. Now, today's text starts with, Now when the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah had no doubts about what God wanted him to do and say. Repeatedly, we're told that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. Like Isaiah and Moses, our young prophet, heard the word of the Lord. God tells Jeremiah, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Here's a reminder to all of us that we are a creation of Almighty God. He knew you before you were the proverbial twinkle in your mother's eye. Because he created you. He formed you into a unique individual, like a snowflake or a fingerprint, different from every other piece of creation. Please hear that. God knit you into his creation. I don't care if you were a result of long-term planning, a surprise package, an accident, or considered someone's problem. God created you. He wanted you to be. You are a part of his plan for this world. You were meant to be in this place and time in history. You have a spot in this world that no one else can fill. God says, before you were born, I consecrated you. That's not just true for Jeremiah, it's true for all of us. To consecrate something is to make it sacred, to make it holy, to give it a divine purpose. God consecrated you before you were born. You have a divine purpose in God's world. He has given each person a gift to be used in his work, to be used for the sake of others and for the betterment of his world. In Jeremiah's case, we read that even before he was born, God appointed him as a prophet to the nations. This brings to mind the last of the prophets, John the Baptist, who leapt in his mother's womb when in the presence of the unborn Son of God, his cousin Jesus. His purpose was to help others recognize Jesus as the Messiah. 
And God showed John the Messiah before either of them were born. In our Sunday morning Bible study, we recently read that God declared to the mother of Samson his divine purpose and destiny before he was born. The same was true for Zechariah regarding his future son, John the Baptist. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says of himself that God set him apart before he was born and called him through his grace to preach Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And God has a divine plan for you, one no one else can fulfill. Jeremiah does what so many divinely called people before and after him have done. He started making excuses. Verse 6, then Jeremiah said, Oh, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Now, this reluctance to be a prophet is nothing new. Remember Moses at the burning bush? God told Moses to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And how does Moses respond? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Oh, Lord, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Jonah got his marching orders to prophesy to Nineveh and promptly hopped on a ship heading the opposite direction. When God called Isaiah, his first response was, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a person of unclean lips. When Elijah had to run for his life because of the message he delivered for God, he walked out into the desert, sat down under a broom tree, and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. God answers Jeremiah with verse 7. Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. God will provide what Jeremiah needs to complete his mission as a prophet. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Read the book of Jeremiah, and you will see that God was faithful to his promise to tell Jeremiah what to say. Of the 349 times in the Old Testament that uses the phrase, thus says the Lord, 157 of them are in the book of Jeremiah. Almost half. Then God added, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Most versions say, I am with you to rescue you. To rescue me? <laughs> um, from what exactly will I need rescuing? This job description just got a whole lot worse. Well, the Lord does not say that everything will be fine. However, God will be present through it all one way or another. He will deliver him. When we walk with the Lord, his presence and deliverance are sure, but there will still be struggles, pain, and trouble. Verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. You see, evil has to be destroyed before good can be built up. Yes, Jeremiah will be allowed to help others to build and plant, but first there has to be some serious destruction. Jeremiah must place 
their choices before them. Life and death, good and evil. He must declare God's ways that those who persist in evil will be uprooted and destroyed. And those who repent will be built up and restored. All God's prophets quickly discovered that their messages of repent or be destroyed were not well received. Verse 17, but you gird up your loins, stand up and tell them everything that I command you. In the days when men wore long flowing garments, they would grab the hem and tuck it up into their belt so the garment would not get in the way of their work, girding their loins. God is telling Jeremiah to prepare himself for a difficult job and prepare now. Do not take time to think over this proposition. Get right to it. God adds, do not break down before them or I will break you before them. And I, for my part, have made you today a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and the people of the land. The words God puts in Jeremiah's mouth place him under a curse. He is rejected by his own people, the very people he longs to save. Nonetheless, God demands that Jeremiah remain strong and steadfast. But again, he does not have to do this on his own. God assures Jeremiah that he will have all the mental strength, fortitude, and endurance that he needs because God has his back. He will be strong like a fortress wall, as strong as iron and bronze, even when facing obstinate kings. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Now we are Jeremiah's audience. If we live in sin and follow the ways of the world, we will be uprooted like a noxious weed and destroyed. If we turn from our sins and walk in the way of the Lord, we will be planted in his paradise garden. We also are Jeremiah's. At Pentecost, Peter quoted the prophet Joel as recorded in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. We are living in the post-Pentecost world. God has poured out his spirit on us, making us prophets. And we are to tell others what is right and what is wrong. And then tell them where to find their strength, as we have in the Lord. We are not weak people. We are weak people with a strong God. And do not forget to tell them the last verse of the quote from Joel. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen.
top of the second page of your bulletin. And we confess, I believe in God who has created all things and continues to create new life within us. I believe in Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, the Savior of the world. By his life, his death, and resurrection, I can know the true joy of abundant life. I believe in the Holy Spirit is present, now and always, calling us to faith, giving us gifts, and empowering us for service. I believe in the community of believers is the church, and we can experience the fullness of life through the word, the sacraments, and all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. Lord God Almighty, as with Jeremiah, you planned to use us before we were born. Give us a vision of your providence over time itself, that in our brief earthly lifespans, we may be your useful persons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, hope incarnate, sustain us with love, fill us with confidence, and hear the sound of our praise. Holy Spirit, as you nurture us in life and we pass from childhood to adulthood, fill us with an active faith, a dauntless hope, and a love so real that we know it can only have come from you. Lord Jesus Christ, when we seek your favor, like our favorite hometown son or daughter, we know it's not you we love, but what we might do, what you might do for us. As you teach us your humble ways and decide how best to reach us, give us the Holy Spirit's eyes to see you at work among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray today for those still trying to recover from the devastation of the tsunami. We pray for protection for those in the paths of the predicted snowstorms coming across our nation this week. We pray for those in the path of COVID, for their safety to not catch it, for their preservation and return to health for those who are fighting it. We pray for the long haulers dealing with symptoms that will not go away. We pray for the first responders and medical staff for continued strength and endurance in the face of a daunting job. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we ask you out of love for one another to visit and care for those among us who need your help. We bring before you today Kelly, <coughs> Stacy, Mary Lou, John, Sandy, Julie, Karen, Ken, Pat, Dan, Allie Ray, Jack, Donna, Tom, Betty, Jeanette, Mary, June, Jean, Rita, Everett, Maureen, and those we name aloud and in our hearts. I pray for the family of our um, dear friend, Kelly, who passed away this week. I pray for the friend and the Lord. Continue prayers for Bill to <clears throat> get stronger and feel better every day. Please give water relief for the horrible headaches he's been having for months now. Pray for children who have to stay home with each other. Give them out. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
for you. We pray for their safety, for those who are in fear of combat, for those who are sent in to battle the COVID virus and bring relief to tired workers. We pray for strength for their families as well. We lift up our churches, Lord, and we pray for them for safety and strength. It's so sad that we now have the government offering training on how to keep churches safe, not just from the virus, but from potential violence. Lord, we just ask that you put your guardian angels around these churches that are trying to preach the truth of your hope and love and light and protect them and all within. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we would be remiss if we did not remember to also give thanks for the many blessings that we have. So we now take time to count our blessings. I would like to have been blessed this week. My good names, I am healthy, baby girl, I am nervous, and thank God for her. Lord, I thank you for my faithful friend, Joy, who has made the trip from Spokane several times and is coming again tomorrow just to minister to me in my spirit. I thank you, Lord, for changing me as I come closer to you in my thinking and my life and my actions. I can see that Father God, we ask now for blessings on our congregational meeting after this service. May it be a time that we seek your will and plan how we can serve you accordingly. We also ask for blessings on the meal that we will share together and count it as a blessing that we have food to eat and the fellowship of fellow brothers and sisters whom we dine with. We also ask, Lord, that you bless the offerings that we will bring forth shortly and that they could be multiplied and used to greater service to your people and greater glory to you. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, Father, we lay before you in the name of he who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
because we are a people who forget so quickly what our Lord has done for us. When he gathered together with his disciples for one last meal before he went to his crucifixion, he took the bread from that meal, and he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to all those present, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, and do this in remembrance of me. And so here we are, 2,000 years later, and we are faithful to do as he has taught us. We gather together, we take the bread, his body, we take the wine, his blood, and we use them for our nourishment and the restoration of our soul. And so therefore, when we come to the altar, we come in humility of what he's done for us. But when we leave the altar, we should leave with joy for what he has done for us, what he has just given us. Therefore, I invite you to come. This is not my table or Bethany Lutheran's, it's the Lord's table. So all who believe this is his body and blood given for their salvation are welcome to come and partake. It's time to have a feast.
We thank you that you have blessed us with this food for making us into one heavenly body, one to the greater glory of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the good news that is Jesus the Messiah bring you great joy each day. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 108, and afterwards, be sure you head downstairs for our meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.